Welcome to The Volley, a podcast by tennis majors, bringing you in-depth insights into tennis's latest hot topics from the tennis majors team. Hello and welcome to The Volley, a podcast by tennis majors. This is the place for conversation and insight into the biggest tennis news around the globe with the Tennis Majors team. I'm your host, Max Whittle, and I'm delighted to welcome you along to this episode as we set off on a journey through the inner sanctum of one of the most influential and successful teams in tennis. Novak Djokovic, who is looking to win his 20th Grand Slam at Wimbledon this week, is without doubt one of the best to ever pick up a tennis racket. And there are some very crucial people around him that help drive his incredible career. Today, we will find out who they are and what they bring to Mr. Djokovic. Here at Tennis Majors, we're dedicated to discussing the latest tennis news via digital media, bringing you, the tennis fan, video, debate and news from the tennis world. So he is a player never out of the spotlight, the world number one, Novak Djokovic. In the case of arguably the greatest tennis player of the modern era, the mental and physical challenges he faces means work around the clock from three key members of staff, Marian Vida, Goran Ivanisevic, who are both coaches, and physio Ulysses Badio. Djokovic often talks about his closest confidants and how integral they are to his success. On today's episode, you will understand exactly what he means. Joining me on the volley today is Serbian journalist Sasha Osmo, who has interviewed some of the closest members of Djokovic's team for tennis majors. He knows them so well, in fact, he might as well be a member himself. Sasha, welcome to the volley podcast. How are you, my friend? Thank you, Max. I'm good as, and as you can imagine, enjoying Wimbledon. <laughs> me too, me too. What have you made of it so far? I think we're having a blast of a tournament. There have been many good matches, a lot of debutants in the quarterfinals, so it's been, it's been really good, but I expect the best is yet to come. Well, no surprise is our subject today. Novak Djokovic is still in the competition. Uh, I think to understand him, and his team, we first have to understand the man that is Novak Djokovic. So what makes his personality and game so unique, do you think? I think one of the main things when it comes to Novak is that he is willing to listen. Actually, when you asked me that question, I remember a chat I had with Igor Chetovic. He's a doctor that used to work with Novak in 2011 that uh, diagnosed his gluten problem. And the one thing he told me about Novak, and it, it wasn't just him, there were many other people that told me the same thing, is that he's willing to try things out. And he's not going to give up. Uh, he's not going to give up if it doesn't work instantly, let's say in a month or two. No, if he believes in an idea, uh, be that uh, approach to life, uh, nutrition or something in his game, he is going to be persistent with it. So he's not going to give up very easily. And I think that's one of, of course, many things allowed him to be the, the player he is today. We will discuss the characters, the specific characters around Djokovic. But well, obviously he's changed his diet quite a lot. Is, are there any left field um, tactics that he's tried? Because as you say, he's, he's willing to do anything to improve. Yeah, actually, I had uh, I had an interview with Goran Ivanishevich. I think it was uh, uh, two weeks ago, and th that that was not the first time that he told me that working with Novak is a specific challenge and that it can get nasty and intense. Exactly because Novak is not the kind of player that uh, uh, that need, that wants people around him, people that tell him what he wants to hear. No, he wants to be challenged and. I know this is a cliche, but uh, from speaking to people around him, it is really a true. It is really truth in his case. Uh, he really wants to improve every day, and uh, even when something in in Goran's opinion cannot be improved further, he he pushes you. He pushes you to to make something up to for him to to become even better. And that's when Goran told me even the return, even though it's probably the best of all time. Sometimes he thinks. There is something wrong with, with the return or can we fix something, can we improve something? So I think that's one of the traits of his character that's 
that's allowed him to improve so much over the course of his career. And I think, I mean, we're at Wimbledon, and if we're talking about Novak's improvements, I think that is one uh, one aspect of his career that no one saw coming. Five Wimbledon, Wimbledon titles being so successful on grass, I think early on in his career, no one expected that. Well, you referenced Goran Ivanisevic. We will talk about him a lot during this episode, one of Djokovic's coaches. But at this point in Novak's career, a record time spent at world number one, chasing a 20th Grand Slam. Has the team around him ever been so important as right now? I think it was important all the time. And uh, I feel that Novak has made uh, very wise decisions when it comes to his team because uh, apart from that uh, period uh, when he had the elbow problems, he never made any rash decisions. I think, uh, for example, you have Vaida and when Marian decided that he could not be his full-time coach anymore, that he cannot travel as much as he did in the past, uh, Novak stuck with Vaida by added Ivanishevich. It's the same thing with his physiotherapists. He is still working with, with two of them and they are just uh, switching places uh, from tournament to tournament. His uh, best friend and best man Milan Amanovic and Ulysses Badio who was the star of this year's Australian Open. So I think Novak is uh, uh, very smart when it comes to picking his team and one thing I feel he appreciates the most is loyalty and uh, if you look at the if you look at the greatest players i mean uh, Novak and Roger and Rafa one of the things they have in common is that continuity when it comes to their teams there have been very little changes and uh, when there are frequent changes of coaches and people around you it's it's really hard to to have success This topic was thrust into the spotlight more so when Djokovic mentioned after winning the Australian Open that he was spending 10 hours a day on recovery and treatment. He had injury issues there. Like all others, he dealt with quarantine. He was playing in a match that had a crowd and then didn't have a crowd because of COVID. Specifically, how did his team help get him through that slam? I mean, that, that was basically impossible. Uh, and uh, Novak did thank Uli, which is Ulysses Badio, his physiotherapist, because they were, uh, they were practically, when they weren't sleeping, they were doing uh, recovery and trying to re rehabilitate him as much as possible in order for him to play. He did not practice uh, between, uh, on his off days, so it was all about recovery. And Uli did a magnificent job, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, I don't think something like that has ever happened. I mean, he did have... Uh, he did have an injury, abdominal injury that was uh, quite serious, but he was, I mean, he was literally 15 hours a day on the table uh, trying to trying to get himself in the state to recover. And I mean, uh, we have to, Novak did say thank you to Uli, but I think it was, uh, aside from Uli's magnificent work, it was Novak's mental toughness that allowed him to go all the way in Melbourne. Does Novak sleep? I think everyone's asking that question now. <laughs> I think he does sleep and he, he puts a lot of emphasis on things like that. You know, in pressers, he always mentions the holistic approach. And I think one of the, uh, one of the aspects of holistic approach is finding and maintaining that balance between work life and rest and recovery. And uh, in that regard, I feel sleep is very important for Djokovic. Now we're going to dive into the characters around Djokovic next and they all say the same thing. If you're an opponent, you don't want to get caught in Novak's machine. What exactly is that? And do you think it's a creation of, for sure, Djokovic, but also the incredible people he has around him? Of course. I mean, if you look at his relationship with Marian Vaida, apart from that one year when they were taking a break, let's say they have been working together for 15 years. And as I mentioned before, Djokovic is not the type of player that uh, just, uh, I mean, it's a really specific relationship. It's not just player-coach, and Novak's mentioned this numerous times. Uh, they're, like a, they're like family to each other. And when they say machine, I think that is that state of mind and state of game of Djokovic, when he just can't miss, when he's hitting every ball cleanly, when he's moving so crisply that you can't put the ball past him. And I feel... I feel that was the kind of machine Stefanos Tsitsipas got himself into it at, uh, at Roland Garros. 
Well, let's begin with Novak's longtime coach. You've mentioned him a few times already, Marion Vida. How has his role evolved over the years? Uh, it, it did evolve a lot because, I mean, when you... Of course, it's not uh, the same thing speaking to an 18-year-old boy and speaking to a 34-year-old man. Uh, of course, it evolved and uh, he, was, uh, he was basically a teacher in the beginning. He's still a teacher, but now he's... Uh, uh, I think uh, sometimes people, uh, because of Vida's good nature and the friendly relationship he, he has with Novak, sometimes underappreciate what he does as a coach for Novak. I mean, if, if you look at Novak's practices, even during slams, there you, you're always going to see a lot of talk about the shots. He's always showing something you didn't hit, I don't know, backhand properly, or you, you should have done this with the serve. So it's, it is X's and O's from Vaida as well, but, but I feel he, he means tremendously to Novak in terms of support, in terms of having someone around him that understands him. Both Goran and Vaida come from the come from the same place from the similar mentality so they can understand each other very well and they get along personally and that is something that cannot be overstated enough because when you're spending so much time with someone uh, the relationship uh, in order for both of you to succeed it has to be good on both professional and uh, personal level well, Vida used to share coaching responsibilities with Boris Becker. Djokovic won six Grand Slams, I think, over three years with the German, and now it's Goran Ivanisevic. So how do these two legends set, share such responsibility? You've been around those practices, and obviously there's a lot of ego involved here. Yeah, that, that, is, the good th that is good thing with, the, with both Marian and Goran. Uh, I can't say, I can't speak as much for his uh, cooperation with Becker because... Uh, because that that was a long time ago it's it's been five years i think but uh, with goran i don't i think they get uh, not think i know they get, get along very very nicely and i think uh, this is just my feeling no one has told me this but I, I think that sometimes maybe they feel that they would want to be at the same tournament together but novak prefers it that way so that he can have a clear and clean line of communication but I know they are Goran and Marian are, are always in touch during tournaments and they are talking. And then when the message is filtered enough for Novak, then the one who is at the tournament just transmits that message to Novak. And uh, I think in order for that relationship to work and to grow, they, uh, they had to put their egos aside. And uh, personally, I don't think that was too much of an ask for them because... Uh, they enjoy working with each other and they have uh, Marian and Goran. I mean, they have similar perspectives on tennis. And when it comes to Novak's game, they have similar perspectives, but just different enough so that they bring their own, uh, their own uh, piece to the table. Well, Djokovic described Ivan Isevich as a, a kind of hero of his when he was watching tennis growing up. What did Novak see in him as a coach, do you think, when bringing him in a couple of years ago? Uh, you can, of course, I mean, we've been talking about Novak's serve for quite some time now. And Djokovic did have a good serve, an excellent serve even before Goran joined. But there have been some little twitches, some uh, changes on little details and specifics. They're not very keen to speak about what exactly. But my feeling is that Novak has, uh, in some types of serves, he has lowered, has lowered his toss. And if you remember... Uh, Novak's uh, finals in Melbourne 2020 against Dominic Thiem one of key points uh, he won by playing serve and volley and instantly he turned to his box and and pointed to Goran and that was a kind of uh, acknowledgement for Ivanishevich and uh, I feel apart maybe from that uh, Wimbledon 2019 final uh, with Federer, in every other big match of Djokovic, since they started working together, uh, his serve was there. Of course, even not in the Roland Garros final last year, but that was not about the serve because Novak played badly on all levels. He just didn't show up. But most of the matches, his serve was there. And I, th I think as his career progresses and he's, uh, he's 34 years now, obviously the serve is getting... Uh, uh, 
more important because he needs more cheap points, more free points on his serve, and he's been getting that from Goran. Apart from uh, apart from that uh, from that uh, serve thing, they what what I mentioned, they get along really well. And Ivanishevic is not the guy that is going to beat around the bushes. He's a very direct kind of guy, and if he means something, then he's going to tell you. And I feel that is what Novak appreciates about him. Well, when you mentioned the serve there, I couldn't help but thinking about how Djokovic bounces the ball so many times before he does serve. And I think that's a nice way to look at the mental approach that he has and what might be going through his mind at that point. Because Goran has said himself that he's never met such a mental rock like Novak. This came in the, the piece you wrote for Tennis Majors. You had an exclusive interview with him. That's something that Goran said. I think he's mentally one of the toughest athletes in the world, not just tennis players. So what does he say to himself, Djokovic, or think to himself when he is down in a match? What are these relaxation methods that we do hear about? I mean, he. Uh, there was, I think, this video after Monte Carlo, preparation for one of his matches. Uh, but I think Novak at, at that point just just uh, lets go, and he has all these techniques, and that's when uh, that holistic approach that he uh, talks about so much comes to comes to fruition, because he is able to level himself, he, he is able to maintain his balance and and to somehow keep calm. I mean, to be completely honest, uh, sometimes I don't even know how he does it, because he's had so many situations situations in his career when you just think okay this is over and then suddenly it's not over it's him winning uh, and lifting the trophy so it's otherworldly in my opinion because he said uh, i mean to beat federer three times on grand slams from double match points down you really have to be an alien <laughs> that's how you describe <laughs> him an alien <laughs> i'm sure he'd appreciate that sasha <laughs> i mean well when you look at it from our, let's say, ordinary people perspective, uh, I I cannot imagine the amount of energy and uh, strength, uh, everything you have to master in order to behave that way in uh, in such crucial points. I mean, uh, Novak sometimes maybe is uh, is a uh, strange from that perspective, but because we we're going to see him lose his cool on uh, in a match where he is leading two sets to love up and. Uh, and everything is going his way, and then he's suddenly starting to to get nervous. But in that match against Federer or uh, versus Nadal a few weeks ago in Paris, he barely had any reactions, maybe two or three during the whole match. So it's like he knows, okay, I can allow myself to be a bit more explosive this time. But when when uh, when the push comes to shove, I really know I have to. I have to stay focused, otherwise I'm going to, I'm going, uh, there is a risk of me losing it. So it's not just coaches then, there's psychologists, I'm sure that Djokovic has tried all sorts of techniques, whether it be meditation, uh, mindfulness, do you, do you know anything about that impact as well that the team have had on him? Well, I, I've, I know about Uli and I know they share, they share similar perspectives, Novak, is, uh, pro, Novak practices yoga and Uli does as well. So there have been many mentions of him practicing yoga in the past. Uh, and of course, everything that goes... Uh, I think that, uh, as I mentioned before, Djokovic is willing to try new things. But also when something does well for him, he, he just sticks with it. And, uh, and one of these things is uh, yoga and meditation and... Uh, all these methods that allow him to to stay calm and centered, and he is not uh, he is not a priori against anything. So he is going to try and see if it works for him. If it does, he's going to keep it. Well, Goran described Novak's physio Ulises Badio as a miracle worker. So, what is the miracle method? Oh, I mean that that's why it's called miracle. Uh, I mean, he's a. Uh, I th first of all, I think Uli, uh, and this is what Marian told me in an interview, I think two years ago. Uli is a uh, is a guy that is obviously a, an uh, a big expert in what he does. But what is aligned with uh, with Novak's approach and uh, Novak's worldview is that he is not. Uh, let's say, uh, I don't know how will this sound, but he is not narrow minded. He combi he practices traditional medicine but chinese medicine as well acupuncture 
kinesiology, physiotherapy, and that is the kind of approach that Novak likes. So uh, again, we're going back to that word a few times already, but holistic approach. And I think that is what suits Novak as well. And it is the way of thinking for, uh, uh, for Ulysses as well. And uh, also, you know, Uli is, a big, Uli is big on visualization. And you know as well that Novak is big in, on visualization as well. But uh, what I wanted to say in the beginning is that uh, Uli didn't turn his place just by being such an expert, which he is obviously. But uh, the one thing I also mentioned before, loyalty. Because he, he stuck with Novak during the hardships, during the, the worst time of his career when he was dealing with elbow injury. And he stuck with Novak. And uh, uh, per Marian Vida's words, he was uh, his influence in... Uh, healing that uh, elbow was immense so uh, over the t over times uh, Novak and Ulysses also made uh, a bond that goes uh, beyond the professional as well and uh, my personal experience with Uli has been tremendous as well he's a really uh, friendly uh, outgoing guy someone you'll always see with a friendly smile on his face so I can only say the best things about Uli Well, speaking of the box and during matches, something else that you talked about on tennis majors that Novak often finds something or someone to fight with during a match. It fuels him, right? Does his coaching team sometimes intentionally get into it with him just to motivate him, do you think? No, I don't think that is the case. I mean, that's what Goran said in that interview. When I asked him why did the, when I asked him about Novak having problems with the sun against City Pass, but I don't think they do it intentionally. Uh, of course, they prefer him, and Novak, uh, Novak himself prefers to stay calm. But sometimes, when he just feels that the emotions and the stress and the pressure is bursting out of him, it's better sometimes to let it go. And uh, sometimes it looks like the, sometimes there are heated exchanges. Uh, not more exchanges. It's just Novak yelling at his box. <laughs> but uh, I, I've spoken. I've spoken to Marian about it, and uh, the, I mean they're completely fine with it. They know each other. It's like I don't know what kind of comparison I can make. But for example, myself here in Serbia, we're really big on basketball, and we're so passionate about sports. And when I go out there and play basketball with my brother, we want to kill each other. <laughs> and we have. And we have. Uh, that sort of attitude, the, what happens on the court stays on the court. So I don't think it ever gets... Uh, I don't think that Marian or Milan or Goran or Uli, they don't get mad with Novak because they understand him, they know who he is, and they know how he behaves outside the court yeah, we as well. can all relate to family competition. Um, and you spoke about Djokovic's visualization. I'm sure he's visualizing a 20th Grand Slam at Wimbledon this week. Uh, Serena Williams is, is still battling to equal Margaret Court's record 24 Grand Slams. Is it a case of business as usual for Djokovic's team as they approach Federer and Nadal or has the intensity perhaps stepped up another level? Uh, it's really hard to say. As for Serena, I think that's a, a nonsense discussion. To me, Serena is the best of all time and when Margaret Court won her slams, it was a completely different time. So... I, I guess that's something for Serena to boost her and to motivate her. But if she hangs up her racket, she's still the best of all time by all means and slams included. Uh, as for Novak, I think there is, uh, there is always going to be a specific kind of pressure. And uh, there is always something. I mean, uh, practically before every match of the big three, when they play against each other, we are talking uh, or uh, seeing headlines like... Uh, one of the most important matches in history or a match that could change the future of tennis. So there is always something and there was always history on the line. I mean, uh, for me, Novak made a huge step in Roland Garros because holding uh, all slams, uh, because having uh, at least two titles and all slams, something that Nadal and Federer haven't been able to do and to do it in a manner that I feel it was the toughest possible. Because playing Berrettini in quarters, Nadal in semis, and then Tsitsipas in the finals, that was the toughest road possible to him winning Roland Garros. And I think uh, after what happened last year in Paris, not many people believed that he would be able to 
to compete with Rafa or to challenge uh, to be a contender for another Roland Garros title. So maybe uh, pressure was even bigger in the Tsitsipas finals and uh, with Novak, with the, with the way he recovers. And of course, I mean, he's going to be uh, 35 next year. The No one has won the battle against time. There is uh, less and less time for him to win slams. But still, I don't think it, it's that kind of urgency. If I don't win this one, it's all over. So he's going to have many more opportunities to, to win more slams. Of course, it would be nice for him to to get to 20 on Sunday. And there there is certainly going to be additional pressure. Marion and Goran have joked that they will quit if Novak wins the calendar Grand Slam. What percentage do you put him achieving that at right now? Oh, I think it's really hard. When you see the past of tennis... Uh, you know why it's really hard. But I think the, the only right approach to this is the one that Novak is taking. And uh, match by match, it's, it's, the only, it's the only approach that, in my opinion, can, uh, can make him stay sane. You know, if he starts thinking about, oh, if I win Wimbledon and there are the Olympics, I'm good at the US Open. If he starts thinking uh, like that or the Golden Slam is near, he's going to lose tomorrow. So... And we all know that in, cha- that in tennis uh, things can change very quickly. I mean, Novak has his own example to look at. After he won Paris in 2016 and holding four, all four slams at once, uh, he was the, big, uh, the biggest favorite to win Wimbledon. And we all know what happened. And actually, that's where his problem started. And he, was, he didn't win a slam for another two years. And there have been many... Uh, more examples, not just with Novak, but for others as well, where where you don't win when you're expected to win, and the other way around. So no, nothing nothing is set in stone, and I feel the competition is great. Uh, I mean, City Pass was very close to winning in Paris. He was two sets to love up. So yes, there go. It, it's a long road ahead, and I think match by match is. Not the best, by the, but the only approach. Well, going back to the people that make Novak Djokovic so special, of all the conversations you've had with Novak's team, Sasha, what response or discovery made you stop and go, wow? <laughs> I think when Marian told me that their team some, after, at one celebration drank 43 <laughs> beers. <laughs> that was... That was the wild moment for me. a very precise number, 43. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. No, I mean, uh, there have been a lot of instances, but uh, it's, not, uh, uh, it's not a specific thing per se, but the way they talk about him and uh, uh, the honesty I feel, sometimes, uh, sometimes you, know, you know, as a journalist, you can tell when you're when you're getting some cliche answers or that people are not saying exactly what they mean. But when I talk with, uh, with Vaida or Goran about Novak, I feel, that they're, I feel that they are brutally honest and that there is, not, uh, there is not something that they're hiding or they don't want to say. So uh, I think everything we've talked about up until now somehow summarizes it. So when you go and do a story for tennis majors and you get access to a party after Djokovic has won a Grand Slam, are you going to be able to keep up? <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of beer. Of course, of course, of course. But we, we drink Rakia here and I know that Marian is also a big fan of Rakia. So uh, maybe we can have a Rakia or two sometimes or five. <laughs> if you could ask one of Djokovic's team any question though, and you knew that you'd get an honest answer, who would you choose and what would you ask? That is, that is an excellent question. You, you needed to give me a heads up on this one. <laughs> because uh, maybe I would be curious. I would be curious to know what were the conversations uh, coming into 2014. Uh, because in my opinion, uh, one of the biggest, if not the biggest win in Novak's career is his win over Federer at Wimbledon in 2014 because outside of Australia he lost a few Grand Slam finals and there were people doubting him. Uh, I would like to go with any of the members of the team, Marian or Boris, uh, through that P- 
period of time and to see how Novak dug himself out of that hole because uh, we all know how he in 2011 what propelled him his new diet and the Davis Cup win we all know about that but this was sort of a mini crisis that doesn't get talked about enough and I would like to know how that process unfold exactly and what were let's say the darkest moments or the moments of the of the biggest doubts for Novak back then and what did they think in, 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 at that time did they think that he was going in, that he will be able to pull through and to become what he is today so much fascinating stuff from our guest Sasha Osmo and once you finish listening to this episode I encourage you to go and read the articles we have discussed here over at tennismajors.com exclusive interviews with those closest to Novak Djokovic So Sasha let's get personal don't worry that sounds more daunting than it actually is um, I think for people listening to understand how much the team around Djokovic matters. Could you tell us the sort of daily pressures and schedule that Djokovic faces? How lonely, how grueling, for example, can it get? I think uh, I think I don't think I'm the right person to to answer that question because I think that uh, like daily routine, that is sort of stuff that only the inner inner circle knows. But uh, what we know from uh, Novak, from what Novak has been telling us. Uh, these past few years it's uh, he does face a lot of pressure but one thing I admire about him is uh, is the kind of how how, how fast he switches I mean uh, for me and I guess for most of the regular people when I go when I go on a vacation I need like three or four days to you know get myself toned and to re- really start to relax and for him I feel that his way of life and the the life of the tennis uh, makes you live, he is able to relax in a second and then go back to a hundred in another second. So I think that's a that's a rare skill I'd like to have. <laughs> Wouldn't we all? Straight on the beach, relax. Uh, can you remember when you first started covering Novak Djokovic? I don't think I, I think I started covering him even before. But one thing early on in his career stuck in my mind. I think it was a. Uh, 2006 Wimbledon against Guillermo Garcia Lopez I think he was three match points down and I was because there was no uh, there was no that ma- that match wasn't on TV I was just staring at my screen at Wimbledon live scores waiting for results to change and that is one of my first memories covering Novak professionally <laughs> and what do you think he w- when you first met him what was he like as a person then and what is he like now I was I was pretty impressed with him because that was the uh, first time we've had some sort of interactions but never one-on-one interview before uh, 2015 Roland Garros and you have to take into consideration that I'm relatively young as well I'm a year younger than him so I didn't have uh, as many chances maybe to to travel or to uh, to work in such a manner but our first interview was in Paris 2015 after his second round match I think it was against Gilles Millet and with his uh, PRs, we have uh, we have made an arrangement because you know what he was chasing back in 2015. So you only have 10 minutes. Uh, but we ended up speaking for 22 minutes. And uh, there were people like cutting it short. And he was always like, no, let's do another more. Que- let's do another question. And that, that really meant to me professionally and personally at that stage of my career. And I remember... Uh, uh, feeling uh, I was a bit anxious before the interview so I told him before the interview so just so you know this is uh, this interview for me right now is like a grand slam final for you <laughs> and he laughed and he laughed and he was like get out of here don't worry it's gonna be okay and from that point on uh, it was a really great professional relationship for me with Novak we've had several interviews one on one many questions in, in press conferences and I feel uh that he is always uh, honest and uh, most of the time he gives uh, insightful answers that are good for, for me as a journalist and not, not just for me, but I, I think that he has a special relationship with all, with all of the Serbian colleagues as well. Well, that's fascinating because the media attention that Djokovic gets can be positive, it can be negative. You've spoken on Tennis Majors, you've written about how honest he always is. 
and sometimes that comes back to haunt him. Goran said in your interview that you know he compared the media attention to with Djokovic to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, yeah. What does Djokovic need from his team when that media pressure builds? I think they just need to sit back and play a good uh, game of Uno, and that's it. Uno, okay. And, yeah, uh, but I, I'm not kidding here. I think when you when you face pressure, uh, that kind of pressure, when you when things in a way are out of your control because you can't control what people are going to write and think, uh, anything, uh, all you can do is disconnect and just focus on your own thing. And I feel that. Uh, when Novak feels that the pressure is too much, uh, in a way he relishes pressure. We've seen with the PTPA what he is doing on the eve of Wimbledon holding a, a press conference. But I think that he can tell very well when it becomes too much that he just needs to uh, to focus on his own routines and to go back to his own world and then we'll deal with everything later. Do you think it's driving his coaching team that this guy could literally finish as the greatest and most accomplished tennis player of all time? Do they care about legacy? Of course, of, of course. I mean, we all want to be successful in our jobs, and I think uh, uh, Goran is. Uh, Goran has told me quite a few times that he's uh, that he's learned a lot, because in tennis, unlike other sports, it's it's a specific relationship with the between the coach and the player, because because the player pays the coach to coach him, which is in the start a bit peculiar. But uh, to get back to your questions, of course, of course, that drives them. I think both both Marian and Goran want to see want to see Novak ending up with the, with the most Slam titles. But I I don't think he, it's uh, Novak is very transparent and open about what he wants, and sometimes that gets misinterpreted as if he's obsessed with something. Uh, I I really don't think he is because uh, if he was, he would burn out in that. In that obsession, but he's he's able to to draw a line and to have this healthy ambition and to have something that fuels him and that makes him go forward. Because if he didn't have ambition uh, to win any more slams, if he just played for, he always goes back and say that he primarily plays for the love of it, love of the game. And I really believe him when he says that. But on the other hand, of course, if there weren't this slam race and this goat race that everybody is talking about him, uh, there would be perhaps less inclination and less motivation to go on. And as for the coaches, I think uh, the same thing applies. Well, we've learned so much today, Sasha. Finally, as we cast our eye over the bigger picture here, which you'd think is a rather large picture for our subject today, from what you've seen, particularly since 2019, when this team was all together, is he on a mission to become the most prolific and successful tennis player of all time? Well, I think you can make quite a decent argument in his uh, on his behalf even now, even if with with his 19 Grand Slam titles to Roger and Rafa's 20. Uh, I mean, he's the only guy that uh, won all of the Masters not once, not twice. As I've mentioned before, the only guy to between the three of them to win. Uh, uh, all slams at least twice. He's the only guy in history that held all four slams uh, on three different surfaces at once. So there are many, there are many statistical categories and numbers that work in his favor. Uh, head to head, uh, he's beaten uh, Roger in his house, uh, what three times in the finals at Wimbledon. He's beaten Rafa twice at Roland Garros. Uh, no, he has a pretty decent argument in my opinion even now and anything he does past this can, also, can only bolster his uh, impressive CV. I think if you play that answer back to Novak's team, Sasha, you'll get a job with Novak's, uh, Novak's tennis team. You'll be in. <laughs> no, no, I'm a journalist. I, w- I want to stay a journalist. <laughs> I, enjoy, I enjoy my work. I enjoy watching tennis and writing about tennis. Well, we enjoy your work too. Thank you so much for sharing your brilliant knowledge on this subject and have fun with the final days of Wimbledon as well. Thank you, Max. You too. You know it's busy, but that's how we love it. Yes, indeed. So a big thanks to Sasha Osmo for joining us and also to you guys too. I hope you've enjoyed this latest episode of the Volley podcast, which is, of course, available at tennismajors.com, Spotify and all main media platforms. Speak to you soon.